Hi folks, my name is George Chamalas. Uh, I've been doing security for about 10 plus years now, and I started off doing work for the US government, uh, pen testing, critical infrastructure type of stuff, then switched over into the private sector where you know, there's an actual bottom line and you could justify good ideas, and uh, worked in you know, a variety of different things, corporate pen testing, that sort of thing then switched over into working independently. And one of the really cool things about working independently is you can work on whatever you want. And so I'd been interested in humanitarian work for, for quite a while. And so about two years ago, I decided to start working in that field. And I'm, I'm here today because the humanitarian technology community needs your help. You know, these, these groups and these organizations that are working in disasters and crises have all the same challenges that, that a normal you know, IT infrastructure has, but they have a whole bunch of new ones that come from the sort of work that they're doing. And one of the things I'd like to talk to you about today is a new technology that's being used in the world of humanitarian response called crisis mapping. And the way crisis mapping works is pretty straightforward. When there's a crisis, there's a set group of professional aid agencies. And they provide aid in the form of medicine, food, water, to people inside of the crisis. And that's the way it's always been. But now, the people inside of the crisis have new technology, communication technology, like uh, phones that can send out SMS messages, and Facebook accounts, Twitter accounts, and they can send out YouTube videos. And as a result, there's a huge amount of information that's coming out of the crisis areas and out of disaster areas. And crisis mapping is the process of collecting that information, processing it into a series of reports, handing those off to the aid agencies so they can provide much more targeted aid to the people that are, that are affected by these, uh, these disasters. Now, the, the largest crisis mapping deployment that's taken place in about the two years since the technology's been around took place following the earthquake in Haiti, where even though the city of Port-au-Prince was decimated when a massive earthquake struck a city that was made entirely out of unreinforced concrete, a group of technologists were able to get the SMS infrastructure back online very quickly. And another group of uh, people were able to procure the SMS short code 4636. And they broadcasted that SMS code out to the, the population saying, send us what is happening around you. And this allowed people on the ground to send out SMS messages that could be picked up. The first problem was they were all in Haitian Creole. So a team of 1,000 volunteers from the Haitian diaspora were contacted over Facebook and plugged into an online system that allowed them to provide translations for these messages. So now we know what is actually being said, but we don't know the location. Because um, remember, this is Port-au-Prince. There was no Google Street View. There were very few geo-reference databases. So those same volunteers and additional volunteers from the internet provided geolocation of the messages based on what was uh, coming through on the SMS. And then those reports were forwarded on to the aid organizations using GeoRSS. It was a really fantastic project. A lot of good work came of it. Um, lives were saved. And it's an excellent example of how this technology can be really useful in a natural disaster. The problem is that natural disasters don't shoot back. And now this same technology is being used in places where there are active hostile groups. The first large-scale deployment that I worked on was supporting a team on the ground in Pakistan who were responding to the nationwide flooding that took place last year, in the middle of last year. And things were going fairly smoothly. We brought a system online. We had teams of volunteers that were geolocating reports from, uh, from the ground as well as field reports coming in from the UN. And then this happened. So now we're in a position where we are building a, a map and there is an active hostile group, the Taliban, uh, who has said that they are going to target foreign aid workers. And we have a giant map that contains the location of foreign aid workers. We had to adapt accordingly. The next deployment that I worked on was in Sudan for a, voting, a nationwide uh, referendum, voting referendum. Uh, this is a, an image of what is believed to be uh, mass grave in the, the South Kardafan region, region that was picked up by a group called Satellite Sentinel. Uh, again, we were working with a local NGO on the ground in Sudan and had to deal with a number of issues. We received obviously fake reports. Things like, everything is fine at this polling lo location and everyone is voting for the ruling party. Stuff that we knew we, we couldn't trust. We had our site blocked by the, by the internet companies inside of Sudan so people could not reach it initially and we had an inadvertent DOS based on the flaw in the platform we were using. The most recent large scale deployment that I did was the Libya crisis map, uh, which we started when, in early March when Libya was just beginning to see some basic civil unrest and we ran it as it turned into a full scale war. The Libya crisis map was unique for a number of reasons and it, one of which is that it was the first time that we worked without a team on the ground. 
Instead, a group that I work with in this field was requested by the United Nations to set this system up so that they could have insight as into what was happening on the ground, both inside of Tripoli and the border towns where there was a significant refugee uh, presence. We had a number of things to deal with at that point, things like protecting the observers, the people who were reporting from the ground inside of the war zone verifying the information that was coming out because it was being fed directly to the response agencies, allowing them to determine what to do, and trusting all of the processing that was done because we used an entire group of volunteers from the internet. What's fascinating when you look at this technology is that uh, the largest deployment took place in Haiti in a natural disaster, and now it's being used in Libya in an active war zone in less than 18 months. And it's an accelerating trend. We now have active deployments taking place in Syria, Bahrain, and Egypt. The good news is, is that the, the good guys are catching on to this technology. They're starting to recognize its value. This is a tweet from the head of the World Food Program talking about how good Libya crisis map is. The bad news is the bad guys are also catching on. This is a, there was a team in, in Egypt that's done a number of these deployments, and last year they were approached by the secret police who demanded back-end access to their system so that the secret police could see who was logging in and submitting messages to them. And so we all work in, in security. We, we all know how this plays out when we start dealing with security of new technologies. And what I'm really concerned about is that we're about to go from the ooh shiny to the oh shit moment in crisis mapping. And, and, and that's a definite concern because in, in this situation we have a lot of very, very significant consequences. Um, the, the, most, the most grievous of which, and the, the one I'm most concerned about is that if something significantly bad enough happens to one of these deployments, if it does get compromised and people do get hurt as a result of it, the big agent, aid agencies, the ones who are best positioned to make use of this technology, will just stop using it. They'll label it as a liability and a risk, and it won't matter that there's lots of people on the ground who are broadcasting useful information because there won't be anyone there to hear it. So there's a couple of us who work in, work in security and have security backgrounds that have been working on this technology. And we're in the process of trying to, to get ahead of the bad guys on this. So what we're doing, you know, the reason I'm here today is I want to talk about what we've done so far, what has happened over the last several years in this, uh, with this technology, and get a little bit of feedback from the audience, both inside the presentation and afterwards, uh, from what the things that I'm saying. Because I'll be discussing not only the bad things that can happen, but some of the ways that we're looking to come up with a you know, basic set of bad best practices. So as I go through this presentation and the rest of the presentation and talk about things, please pay attention. If you, there's something that I don't say, something that I don't talk about, uh, an attack that you see, a vulnerability that you see, please remember it. Uh, if there's a little bit of time at the end, we'll try to take some questions. I'll be back in the speaker's room afterwards, or please contact me by email, because it's entirely possible that you could come up with something that we aren't seeing. And as a result, we could build that into these best practices, and they could really help people out in the field. And finally, we want to get some interest in the security community because this is really important technology. There's a lot of good work to be done. And we went through a couple different ways to present this information and realized the easiest way to do it would be to just walk through the, the steps that take place in an actual deployment. Um, I, had, I had planned to bring an online system that would allow people to go through and you'd be able to send attacks at it during the, during the presentation. Um, the problem was is right before uh, I flew out here, I noticed there was a really awesome new feature that was inserted into the platform I was going to be letting uh, everyone attack, and that is the ability to add arbitrary JavaScript from the admin interface to the site. Which is an awesome feature. You know, you can do all sorts of great stuff. And, and then I thought about it happening at DEF CON. And uh, <laughs> so, so um, you know, I've, got to, I've got the images online. I'll talk about where you can grab those if you want to download them and, you know, you know, JavaScript inject yourselves to your heart. So, you know, the, the, the cool thing about this is that the, the, the approach that, that's taken in these types of deployments all pretty much runs the same way. You know, there's just been a blank in the country of blank. As a team from blank, we're responsible for deploying a crisis map in order to blank. Um, just to kind of speed things up, let's just say that there's been a revolution in the country of Turakistan. Uh, and if you've never heard of Turakistan, it's because it doesn't actually exist. So let's just assume it's somewhere around here-ish. Um, and and uh, Turakistan has been uh, ruled by a dictatorial government, uh, the Kim power and a military coup, a very active secret police uh, tendency to monitor the internet, monitor the cell phone networks, and uh, arrest, torture, and kill people that disagree with them. So uh, to make things a little bit more interesting, uh, what I'd like to do is I'd like to have you guys play a certain role as we go through. We're going to be asking some questions about what do you want to see, what do you think is a good idea for these types of deployments. And uh, over at Black Hat, what I did is I split the audience up into the bad guys and the good guys. But we're all devious bastards here, so let's just say that you're the bad guys and you're also the bad guys. 
So, so as we go through, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Um, and I'm going to ask you, if, you guys are, if you're the bad guys, if you're the Tarakistani secret police, the, the local terrorist cell, the local uh, you know, drug smugglers, what do you want to see happen? What is going to give you the best opportunity to compromise these deployments, to screw things up, to stop the people from succeeding? And the first question is, as a team from the blank, you know, who is it that's going to be setting these things up? And the, the most important thing that, that we found for these types of deployments is that the people who, setting, who are setting these things up and running them do need to be on the ground. Uh, until we get to the point where all the aid agencies and all the aid organizations are know to connect into these systems, it's imperative that there be uh, uh, advocates on the ground who can go to the meetings, you know, the group meetings, interact with the people that are actually doing the work and make them aware of what is happening. And based on the experiences that we've seen, these are kind of your range of options for who would be running this thing. Uh, everyone from a group of individuals not affiliated with any particular organization, a local NGO, uh, media organization, and for this, for this example, let's assume that it's a member of the uh, independent media organization, not the Trakistani state-run media. Uh, an international NGO like the Red Cross um, or the, the UN or a military type organization, an external military, not the Trakistani military, um, who, who's running this. So what I'd like to do is take a second, think about this. Picture yourself as a bad guy. Think about what you would do to each of these groups and who you would like to see running it to give you the greatest opportunity for, for screwing up the deployment. I'm going to take a drink of water. All right, now can I get a show of hands? Who here wants this platform to be run by an individual? All right, who wants to be run by a local NGO? Who wants to be run by an international NGO? And who wants it to be run by the military? All right, now one of the things that I'm concerned about as I go in through and you know, talk about this is that when we go back to the crisis mapping community, one of the first things that's gonna happen is uh, I'm gonna be accused of giving the bad guys ideas. Of, of listing the attacks that can take place. And so I could try to go through and, and lecture the, the people I'm talking to about security, security through obscurity, uh, why you must assume that the bad guys know the system. Uh, but instead, I'd like to make the point that I stood in front of a group of people at a security conference and presented this to them. And knowing nothing about it, they were able to spot X, Y, and Z attacks. So can I get a couple, one or two people to put their hand up and tell me what you picked and why? Yes. That's a great point. So she said an uh, international NGO because they don't necessarily understand what's happening on the ground and they do have resources and supplies, things that the bad guys would want to pick up. Somebody else. Yes, sir. Yep, that's an excellent point. So the idea is uh, he wants to use an individual because he can corrupt the individual and then make use of the technology. One more person. Yep, so a local NGO, because they can be worn down, they're gonna get exhausted, they have limited resources, and when they, when they start to get worn out, you can take them out. All excellent, absolutely great, great points. Thank you very much. I'm gonna ask that a couple more times. And the cool thing about this is that this, these are answers that seem like, you know, because, duh, to us, but when you start talking to people who don't think like security people, who don't think in terms of attacks and defense, it's gonna be things that they won't, they won't immediately understand. And so this is very helpful to be able to say, we came up with this because it's just obvious to people who think this way. And so you have to assume that somebody who is paid by a government, by a state organization, to be a devious bastard is gonna come up with it as well. So this is the breakdown, it's kind of my off the cuff uh, breakdown of who's currently running these types of deployments. What you see is by and large, a lot of them are being done by individuals because people can just set this technology up, they don't have to get approval. There's a pit that's being picked up by local NGOs um, more and more. There's been some tests by media organizations. Al Jazeera did a pilot in, um, oh God. In, Israel, in Gaza, uh, Al Jazeera did a pilot in Gaza. There's been some basic work by international NGOs, so there'll be a crisis map. And there's, there's one or two groups that I'm aware of in the US military who are working with this technology. The, the issue is, the, the first issue is that there is no, you know, 
central organization who's responsible for doing this. So the entire process for setting up is entirely ad hoc. This is a quote that came across one of the uh, crisis mapping groups shortly after the Mumbai bomb blast, asking if anybody knew of a map that was online so that they could send volunteers to it. The problem is, is there's, there's this pervasive assumption inside the community that just because you have the skills to set up one of these systems means that you have the same skills needed to run it. And in fact, the, the skills needed to actually set it up are tiny compared to the, the skills and the, the effort needed to run it. Think about uh, the, the Haiti response required over a thousand members of, of the, the diaspora community to, to work for weeks on end. And just because somebody set it up doesn't mean that they actually know what they're doing. But because we're in the place where we don't know who's going to be setting these things up in any given crisis and a disaster, we're at the point where we have to build trust on the fly with whoever's running them. And what we found in doing this is there's kind of three core concepts that we can use for trying to determine trust on the fly. The first is corroboration. I was contacted by the group in Egypt that was then contacted by the, the secret police. And I had no idea who they were. But I had a colleague that was working with them. I trusted her and she could corroborate their story. The next is reputation. The individual who set up the deployment in Pakistan um, was, was a guy who was a TED fellow and a, a tech CEO. And so you know, TED, the, the, the Smart People's Conference, they do vetting. You know, he's a tech CEO, so he has to have some kind of a skill. Um, still, he knew nothing about crisis mapping, but he seemed to be kind of a, a smart guy. And then finally, we have history, you know, past experiences with a particular person. And in this case, the, the, the individual who set up the uh, crisis map to help the Mumbai bomb blast was somebody that we'd worked together with on, on PAC report in Pakistan. So we had a background with him. But the, the problem with any, just anybody being able to set these things up on the ground is, is like you mentioned, direct attacks. Uh, these are news reports about bloggers who've been arrested. These are people who set up one website with just their opinion on it. And uh, it, to my mind, that uh, these, these types of crisis maps are one website with potentially thousands and thousands of people's opinions and thoughts on it. So the, the idea that they could be targeted in the same way as bloggers makes uh, pretty, uh, seems like a pretty short jump to me. And remember, we're in a position where the secret police are already contacting these groups. Uh, so when you think about direct attacks, we've got kind of a range of vulnerabilities where the, the individuals, the local NGOs on the ground, like you guys said, are the ones who are most susceptible to attack. Uh, the, the other concern is that we don't have to worry just about direct attacks, we have to worry about indirect attacks, infiltration of groups by, uh, by, by you know, hostile organizations. And this could be something like uh, someone is picked up and their uh, account is, you know, tortured out of them. This could be somebody who is, you know, paid by money. This could be a computer that is hacked. And our, our primary defense against that is isolation of operations. This is equivalent to the, the need-to-know approach in, the, in the, the government security community. But what you see when you think about isolation of operations is that the smaller the organization, the higher the likelihood that a compromise could lead to a compromise of the actual deployment. Another reason why this should not necessarily be done by individuals. Um, so we have our threats to deployment managers, but let's assume we've got somebody who's, who's willing to do this. The next question is, they're responsible for deploying a crisis map. And crisis maps have got to do a couple of things. They've got to collect messages from the ground, process them into reports, and then present those out. And right now, you have kind of three, op three options for what your crisis map platform is going to be. You can code it from scratch, just hack it together. They're, they're fairly straightforward pro uh, programs to run. You've got to be able to pull things in, put them on a map somehow. You can include together existing geolocation services and social media services. Or there's, we're also beginning to see some uh, open source applications that are being built specifically for this and used in the field. So back to you guys as the Trakistanis. Um, when someone wants to set one of these, these things up, what do you want them to use? Think about it for a second. All right, who wants to, who wants to see a platform that is coded from scratch? All right, who wants to see uh, existing services kludged together? All right, and who wants to see the use of open source applications? So by and large, open, open source applications. Why do you want it to be an open source app? Is that, the, is that why you want to do it as a, as a bad person or as a good person? You're saying that it's uh, useful and transferable to other situations. Oh, you're not a bad person. Okay, we have one good guy. Uh, how about somebody who is a bad person and wants to tell me why they'd want it to be an open source app? Exactly. Yeah. You know, so you have the code, you can figure out your attacks ahead of time, you know how to subvert it. One more person. Show of hands. Gentleman in the blue shirt, what'd you pick and why? 
Open source for the same reason? Yeah, so what we're seeing a lot is actually this is being used primarily by open source projects. Um, and the key from, from the good person side for using open source projects is that they, they are adaptable. Um, we are dealing in very fast paced situations where we need to, uh, we don't have time to go back and ask vendors for a patch if something goes wrong. Um, and we, we need to be able to add new features and new functionality on the fly as it's needed by our deployment, by the response organizations. But the downside, of course, to that is we are going to have code vulnerabilities. Um, this is going to take place whenever you write something that's code. Uh, the particular uh, open source app that we use a lot is one called Ushihidi. And uh, one of the great things about Ushihidi is you can make reports uh, private until you decide to approve them. Uh, these are the, the three leaks that we found in, in this process. So you can connect to the uh, private reports by going directly to the URL for that report, and they're all labeled sequentially by ID number. Um, you could, they showed up in the reports listing, so just the public reports listing of reports. They didn't think to check the uh, privacy flag, and they also leaked into the search system. And, and this, is, this is kind of funny from a you know, security standpoint, because they kind of screwed it up just about every possible way you can. Um, the problem, though, is that we found the direct URL access bug uh, during the Sudan deployment. We found the reports listing bug during the Egypt, one of the Egyptian deployments, and the search leakage during the Libya crisis crisis map deployment, all situations where we're dealing with sensitive information. So, so code vulnerabilities are definitely a concern. Uh, one of the ways that we've gone around uh, dealing with that is, again, an isolation of operations approach where we took the, the actual data that was being collected uh, that included you know, personal and sensitive information and ran that on a completely private system. So the Libya crisis map initially started off as a password protected, limited access deployment that was only given, ac that, uh, where access was only given to response organizations who contacted the UN. And midway through the deployment, the UN thought, wow, this is really great. This is really useful. This is really impressive, impressive work these people are doing. Let's make it public. So, so now all the, the, the analysis, the collection that we've done, they were asking us to, to make it publicly available to anyone on the world. So what we did uh, as a compromise on that is we kept our private password protected system uh, where we had an ideally you know, limited attack surface because everything was behind a, at least basic authentication, and we set up the public Libya crisis map, which is the thing that was promoted on the internet. And that public crisis map did not receive any kind of sensitive information. We, re we stripped out all the analysis and the descriptions and left only just the title of the, the report, the location, and if there were public links to media organizations, we left those in as well. And we put the entire uh, the transfer process on a 24-hour delay so that there is a kind of limiting the usefulness of the data to people on the, the outside world. The, the next thing we have to decide is where do you want to actually have this deployed? So you have to run the system somewhere and your, your basic options again are a local server on the internet or hosted on the cloud. So could I get a show of hands from the Trakistani bad guys out there, where do you want this system to be hosted? Do you want it to be hosted on a local server in the country? Do you want it to be hosted on the internet? One hand and then you put it down really quickly. Uh, do you want it to be hosted on the cloud? All right, someone who said they wanted to host it on the cloud, could you tell me why? Sir. Okay, so you can shut down the internet and then uh, cloud providers have insecurities, you can get access to it. How about somebody who said they wanted it on a local server? Sir. Actually, ma'am. Gain physical access? Yep, yep, it's much easier to attack something that's local and it's inside your country. So uh, you're absolutely right. The, the main concern for, for local servers are direct attacks. Fortunately, we haven't had that happen uh, that I'm aware of. Uh, what we have had, though, is service interruption on the internet. You know, the, the bad guys have figured out the, the internet off switch, um, not only to shut off internet for the entire country, but also for uh, specific sites. So um, Egypt and Syria have just flat out cut the internet. Bahrain has significantly upped the number of sites that they're blocking. This is what happened to us, we believe, in Sudan. Fortunately, we were on a cloud provider, and so we were able to just switch IPs really quickly, and they weren't able to catch up and catch on to the fact that our IP was, had changed and the site was back online. Um, the other thing we have to worry about is message interception. Uh, we understand that you know, network traffic can be, can be compromised and we have different ways that we can deal with that. Uh, this is a report from the Wall Street Journal talking about how the, there's a belief that the various groups inside of the Middle East are using uh, different tools to actually crack Skype. And this is something that's particularly concerning for us because Skype is one of the, is like the de facto communication standard that's used for everybody who's doing this sort of work. 
So what we're working on uh, to deal with this is the concept of um, you know, we, we know that the, the local servers are potentially vulnerable to attack. We know the cloud servers um, can be blocked if they're shut off. So we're working on systems to synchronize and anonymize traffic back and forth. So this is similar to what we were doing with Libya Crisis Map where we're switching between a public and a, a private instance. But we're also going to be doing it uh, from the, the you know, the, the cloud back onto the ground. So, and the, the off chance that some that the server is attacked, that the server is compromised on the ground, the the, the bad guys aren't going to be able to find the sort of sensitive information that they're going to want to get, and they're going to want to be able to use. Um, so we we've gone through you know picking up a, a lot of these. Uh, covering a lot of these questions, you know, who are we, where are we deploying, what are we deploying, uh, and, and the last question of course is, you know, what are we going to do this for? And there's a huge variety of different things that this can be done for, uh, doing things like uh, tracking the location of people in need that have been affected by a crisis, uh, monitoring for, for war crimes and collecting information that can be used in prosecution later, uh, directing, uh, directing uh, people I mean, directing, directing aid. And the, the, the big concern, though, is that we've gone through all this work and all these different ideas and all this, this different you know, thought process and looked at these different vulnerabilities, but we're still inside of that tiny little dot. There's still a lot of work that has to be done around these types of deployments to actually make them successful. And we have things like spreading the word, actually getting the message out to the populace, to the people that we're going to be collecting information from about what it is that, you know, that, that we're looking for and what we can provide. And we've got a couple of different options. The first is I mean, pass it on to no one. Just passively collect the data that's coming in. Use a private network, particularly ideally people that have been trained ahead of time. This is what's being done in a lot of the vote monitoring types of deployments where it's being using a small set of vote monitors who already know protocols both for you know, reporting and ideally for security. Or you can just put the word out to absolutely, totally everyone out there who will listen, letting them know, hey, this thing is online, send us your information. The, the first concern with, mess, with passing the message out is misinterpretation. This is the equivalent of when you call your doctor and they say, if this is an actual emergency, please call 911. And in situations where the system that's being used to collect this data is not directly linked to the response organizations, kind of indirectly linked, there's people on the ground trying to promote it for, for use by the response organizations, there's the possibility that they could be intercepting messages and the people on the ground could think that they're going to be getting an, an, automated res or an automatic response from this. And so they won't think to go out and contact the actual aid or organizations who may be better positioned to, to give them aid. Another concern is message corruption. This is a, a tweet that went out uh, during, a, a, during the Sudan, uh, not the Sudan deployment that I worked on, but another one that was tracking violence inside of Khartoum. Basically saying, hey, don't go to this site. It's been infiltrated by the, the Sudanese the Sudanese government. Uh, the problem with this, uh, there are a number of problems. The first is that it was actually a false message. Um, the, the actual message had been sent out by the people running the platform that people should not use SMS to contact the platform because they couldn't trust that it wasn't being intercepted. But by the time it made it to Twitter, the message had turned into, don't go here, it's been compromised by the government. So the message that's being passed out is liable to be, uh, to, can be inadvertently uh, corrupted, but there's also the potential that it can be intentionally corrupted. So the, the, next, the next step is collecting messages. We've gotten the word out. The platform is online. People have heard about it. And they're now starting to send data back in. And there are a couple of different options for the actual collection. You have direct collection processes from things like SMS, phone, things that are definitely coming from one person directly to your platform. The other process is to use something like social media where it's being broadcast out to the world and we're just going to be collecting it from there. And then the final one is to collect reports that are coming in through the media. The, the primary concern with the submission of messages is attribution. The ability for people who are monitoring these systems to be able to uh, track the message back to an individual. And when we're dealing with uh, direct, direct messages through you know, SMS, email, or, or people connecting to a particular site online, at that point, somebody who's mo monitoring the network has got both the endpoint where the system is going to, where the messages are going to, and they're able to track back the people who are actually sending them. Uh, in, in the case of social media, it's a little bit more indirect because the message is kind of going up to some place in the cloud, some, some kind of service, and it can be very challenging to hunt that, that message down and then figure out who's behind it and uh, who, who their, what their username and password is and then figure out who this actual person is. Um, uh, however, we do now have these platforms that are collecting these messages for people and presenting them online, which could cut out at least the hunting down the message part for the bad guys. 
And then we have protected attribution from the media, where they have a, a, a by far a much more limited scope and, and understanding of what's happening on the ground compared to the entire citizen population who's got you know, phones and SMS capability. But they do have a little bit of coverage because they are media, and they're able to protect not only themselves, but ideally they've got uh, systems in place to also protect the people that are reporting to them. Uh, again, with any kind of collection process, we do have to worry about service interruption uh, and message interception. You know, these same sort of issues that are going to affect the, the platform location are also going to affect the passing of messages. Um, the, the, the next stage is we've gone through, we've collected, we've put the word out, we've uh, put the platform online, things are going relatively smoothly, people are now starting to send messages into the platform, messages are being collected. Now those messages need to be processed. And that processing is, is not necessarily that easy. You know, think about Haiti. In, in Haiti they received over 50,000 SMS messages in the several weeks of, during their deployment that all needed to be looked through and processed. And so the, the, the processing has to be done by somebody. Uh, or some system. And right now the, the sort of groups that we have to do this are a local team on the ground, which is what the, the Haiti deployment eventually transitioned over to. That we're now seeing in the crisis mapping community uh, teams of individuals who are you know, members of this community and willing to work for this, uh, work on these deployments and are aware of it and kind of know the ropes. Um, they're still relatively small relative to the, the online volunteers, just anybody out there on the internet, which was used initially uh, in, in the Pakistan deployment that we worked on. There's also beginning to see the, some initial work on automated analysis. I like my internet clouds there. Um, some automated analysis. Uh, systems to actually process these messages in an automated fashion. The, the problem is, is those are still very experimental systems and in any case they're going to need to be fed good data by, uh, that are, that's created by groups of people. So at least for the, for the immediate future we're going to have to rely on groups of people to process the messages one way or the other. And right now the, the, the primary technology that people are using, these groups are using are giant shared Google Doc. They just take all the volunteers, throw them into you know, a shared Google Doc and give them kind of a basic workflow of how they should go through and process these messages. Uh, from a security standpoint, it's terrifying uh, that, they're, that they're doing this, but uh, from an actual usability standpoint, it, it, and it pains me to say that it actually works halfway decently well because you can actually get groups of people online, they can see everybody else is working on it, they can see the progress is being made, it's a very good morale builder. Um, uh, this, particular, uh, this particular doc was one of the ones that was used during the Libya crisis map by a group called the Standby Task Force that uh, I helped found last October to start standardizing some of the, the processes and the response and organizing uh, groups of individuals into teams to deal with each of these, each of these efforts. The, the one issue with the Standby Task Force that we have is that it's designed for short-term deployments. And we started off the Libya crisis map with a sm relatively small group of people that were pulled from the community that we were already aware of. And then when it came time for us to transition off, uh, we went back to the UN and said, we're a short term solution here. Uh, we need to either shut it down or you guys need to find people to work on it. And they said, oh, that's no problem at all. We've got a UN volunteer core that we can put out broadcast to the entire internet saying who wants to work on this stuff. So we went from our relatively small closed community of people to an open call across the internet to say who wants to work on this system. So all the operational security that we put in place around you know, protecting people's privacy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, was going to be blown by the opportunity for infiltration. Um, and again, we're back at this concept that it could be somebody who is, who is turned, somebody who's working directly for a state organization, et cetera. The, the folks who let people into the Libya crisis map through the UN, um, they, they did do, try to do some basic um, background checks on the people. They asked for Facebook accounts, uh, Skype IDs, uh, Twitter accounts, to try to prove that they were like an actual person. Um, but, but that's not actually real security. Uh, what we're looking at instead as a potential model is uh, to deal with uh, something called crowdsourced microtasking. The idea that we can take the steps that are involved in the processing of these messages and split them up into kind of siloed uh, processes that only, uh, that, that people would only be able to work on kind of like a, an assembly line on one particular action, be that you know, geolocation or categorization or filtering. So what we'd be able to do ideally is add at the front of this uh, queue something for anonymization. So we could take people that have an established trust uh, inside of an organization and uh, 
focus their work on just stripping out you know, personally identifiable information and then passing that on to other people uh, further on down the chain to provide different pieces of work. Uh, one of the concerns though is that we, we've now still got, you know, we've, we've kind of added in this, this idea of privacy so we can strip out the, the identifiable information but we now have to worry about things like accuracy. Uh, the, this, the, the microtasking system there was used last week for a deployment or for an exercise that replayed some of the um, English translated hate messages from Haiti. Um, and the, the team involved with a team of volunteers went through using this, this microtasking system to do each of these steps, including geolocation. And it, it worked pretty well. Uh, when, when you look at these, this map, you know, seeing where these volunteers were able to identify where inside of Haiti the messages were coming from, inside of Haiti, Haiti. Haiti where these messages were coming from. Um, this is where the rest of the, the messages that they were processing ended up getting mapped. Um, because what we had was untrained volunteers going through, taking the first thing that looked like a location, slapping it into Google Maps, and then copying the latitude and longitude back into the report. So we had things all over the place. Uh, you see a big bump inside of France uh, where the, the Haitian Creole uh, is very similar to, to French, and so there's a lot of French names for towns. Um, my favorite, personally, is the one that they put in Alexandria, Egypt, which means that they not only didn't realize what they were doing, but it didn't occur to them that the Arabic script on top of the city names was unusual. Um, so we have to worry about, worry about inaccuracy in the system, and this is people that are doing, trying to do their best, and it doesn't even take into account the potential for people who are trying to purposefully uh, put in misleading information. And so the, the solution that we have to that is more sophisticated crowdsourcing. The, the image here is from a, a crowdsourcing platform that was used during uh, the Pakistan deployment that's run by a company called Crowdflower. And Crowdflower has got a significantly, just a really, really cool infrastructure in place that lets you do something beyond just presenting the information. You can actually track and score the people who are working on it. So again, we're starting to see this, this concept of corroboration where uh, in, in the Pakistan deployment, we required that before a message was moved on through the geolocation step, multiple people had to agree that it was in the same place. And this is multiple random people. Uh, we also have the ability to ha get uh, scoring accuracy from the people that are working on these platforms. Uh, this is done by inserting known good data, you call it gold data, into the message stream and seeing where, what answers people come up with based on that gold data. So you're kind of inserting tests into the process as they're working on the system. And then finally, places like Crowdflower, uh, they have existing user bases, because it's used similar to Mechanical Turk, uh, by a, a group of people who are familiar with the system. And so you're able to see this kind of reputation where you've, you can see like they, they've been, uh, they worked on this other thing, and they were pretty accurate. Um, and so we hope that systems like this will help us you know, deal with the inaccuracy and help minimize the, the potential disruption from people who are just making honest mistakes or people who are inside the system trying to purposefully screw, screw things up. And so we've gone through this entire, we've gone through this entire process. Uh, we, we've set up the system, we've put the word out, we've collected the messages, and now we're at the final step, or the, the, the final step where we need to decide what we want to, to approve, what we want to think is actually true. And report verification is something that is the, the, the primary question that we're always asked by the aid agencies. It's kind of the big question is, how can we trust this information? How do we, how do we verify this data? And, and the answer is, it's very, very hard. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Gay Girl in Damascus blog. A show of hands, how many, how many people heard of that? All right, so for those of you that don't know, um, the Gay Girl of Damascus blog was this blog in, in Syria that was d chronicling the life of this, this, this young girl who was uh, living in Syria under this d despotic regime, and there was you know, bad things happening to, to people who were homosexual, and everyone was really concerned about it. The, the problem was that the gay girl in Damascus was actually a married guy in Ireland. Uh, and the entire thing was completely and totally faked. And he got away with it for months and months and months, um, fooling everybody. And it was on CNN, et cetera, et cetera. And this, this is really, really going to be a, a very difficult problem to deal with. Uh, and there is no easy answer to it. The, the best the, that we're working on right now is, again, that concept of uh, corrobor corroboration, reputation, and history. And the Gay Girl in Damascus blog is an excellent example of that, where uh, the, the information was out there, people, people believed it. It was very accurate, it was very detailed. But where this started to fall apart was when uh, a reporter, I believe, from the, from the UK 
who is widely known as kind of being an authoritative source of the mining of social media, um, he received word from some people that he knew that there were certain, certain things inside of these, these messages, inside of these blog posts that weren't adding up. Uh, they couldn't find people inside of the gay community in Damascus who knew of this, of this girl. And then they started digging more and more and more into the actual electronic side of things and found things that, uh, th that further didn't line up, like where the domain was registered, where the, the posts were coming from, et cetera. And so we, we see another use case for this concept of, of corroboration. You know, the, the information couldn't be corroborated by people who are on the ground. Um, you know, reputation, where the word came out from... Uh, from a reporter who was you know, very, very well established as being accurate for information in the Middle East. And, and he, in turn, got that message from people who had a long history of trusted reports. Uh, so from there, they were able to work this back. Uh, we had a, a similar case uh, during Libya crisis, the Libya crisis map where we received word that, uh, including images, that, uh, that indicated there were white phosphorus attacks taking place, which would have been a very, very serious escalation in hostilities. Um, and uh, what the volunteers were able to do is they dug into the metadata for the reports, you know, as it was told to me by one of the coordinators, and were able to pull out information that indicated to them that this, was not, this did not take place at the time that they, uh, the report was purporting that it came from. And so they ultimately dismissed it, and there have not been, to my knowledge, any further reports indicating that that was actually true. So, so when we go through this, this, entire, you know, this entire process, we still end up back at this concept of corroboration, reputation, and history. And then the, the, the final step, you know, when the, once the reports are actually put online and they're, they're, they're presented, there's the possibility that it kind of, it, it's no longer in our hands what's actually going to happen to it. Uh, the first concern is things like misinterpretation. Uh, one of the... Uh, one of the first deployments that I ever did just when I was starting to get used to this technology was tracking a, a night of rioting that took place in my hometown in Oakland. And I was just monitoring Twitter and pulling information from Twitter and from the, the news reports about what was happening on the ground. And at one point, there was a woman who, or there was a cop car who was kind of starting to get closed in by, by protesters and he was backing up, I mean, maybe 10-ish miles an hour. And he, he just brushed a woman that, was, that didn't see the cop car coming. The woman went down. Uh, my understanding is that she then got back up and was able to leave and, and walk away. And we saw this happen. We actually, you know, it's, it was, it's on video. You can find live video from the helicopters of this happening. And uh, we were now faced with the question, like, do we want to report this? Was, was this actually news? And we decided not to. Uh, and then the next day, I received an email from, from uh, kind of an acquaintance on the East Coast saying, hey, I saw your map. It was really great. But you didn't, you didn't have the report about the woman who was murdered when she was run over by the cops. And, and that's it's, it's a great example of how, how these things can get away from you. And... and, and you know, I responded back to her, no, we didn't report that because it didn't happen, et cetera. The other thing we have to worry about is manipulation. If something does get all the way through, what can be done with uh, purposefully forged uh, reports and how can we detect those? I really, really liked uh, Moxie's concept of, of trust agility, and I think that's something that we're absolutely going to have to work in to our system going forward uh, at every step in this process is the ability to retract uh, who we trust uh, in any given situation. And finally, the, the, the risk of utilization, the possibility that these messages, these platforms can be utilized uh, by the bad guys. And this is one of the reasons that we've tried to do things like keep them private, not post them online unless we have to. If we do have to present information, prevent, presenting information that is, that is delayed, that is not as useful to an adversary. And so we've got all these problems, all these potential issues, all these things that can go wrong. And the, the, the big question is, is it worth it? You know, as, as somebody who's working in security and, and has, has had to deal with a lot of these deployments, you know, even with all the things that can go wrong, all the potential attacks, my opinion is that, yes, it's absolutely worth it. Uh, this technology, despite the, the issues, has got a huge amount of promise. And the, the challenges that come in are things that, that are expected. You know, they're being, this technology is being used in, in hostile conflict zones where there is an absolute need for security. And it would be silly to think that for some reason the IT side of things would be exempt from that need for security. And so the, the, the approach that we'll be taking over the next months and, and years is going to be to develop a set of standards and best practices that can be used to allow people to do these types of, uh, types of deployments safely and securely and identify uh, the ways and, and kind of get the word out so that people know about it and they're able to do these things uh, at the beginning. And the, the other reason is that eventually something is going to go wrong. Someone is not going to get the word. Uh, something is going to slip through the cracks that, that, we, weren't, that we weren't expecting, a new attack 
attack is going to emerge and bad things will eventually happen. And when that does, it's going to be vitally important that we have something to show the, the response agencies, the, the, the large organizations who would be inclined to, to walk away from the technology at this point and to be able to explain to them that this technology can be done securely. There are things that can be done and unfortunately in this particular case, you know, something got through. So we will have a response in the event that something, does, something bad does happen. Because this technology has got a lot, of, a lot of things it can be used for, not just inside of a, an actual disaster. Uh, this is the, what became of the, um, the, the, the Haiti deployment. It was initially set up for the response to the earthquake and is now run by a local company inside of Haiti who is using it to track a significant amount of information, not just about you know, the, the actual disaster. And it's become a resource to the entire community, tracking everything from the location of hospitals um, and, and the cholera response. And it's, it's become established as a long-term ongoing support to, to the, the, the Haitian country and, and will be there in place for the, the next disaster whenever, whatever that is. So the, there are a couple of groups that, that I'd like to specifically call out uh, that are doing really great work in this area and an excellent opportunity for people who are interested in, in working in this space. Uh, the first is crisismappers.net, which is the kind of the main, one of the main mailing lists and main community groups for the, the crisis mapping community that includes both uh, members of the, the volunteer community, the, the developer community, and uh, a growing, uh, significantly growing group of professional responders who are taking part in this. The next is the standby task force, which is a group that's been responsible for providing volunteers for these large-scale deployments. Uh, we're working on developing you know, standard te tools, technologies, and workflows to make this possible. And this was the team that worked on the Sudan referendum and the Libya crisis map. And finally, Crisis Commons. Uh, is Heather here? So Crisis Commons is a group that was started by Heather Blanchard, who's a, a longtime member of the Media Goons. Uh, and they, they do a number of, a number of different projects, uh, from everything from setting up uh, wikis during disasters to providing weekend hackathons where people can contribute code and, pro and uh, you know, new tools for some of these deployments that are taking place. And they do, they do fantastic work. On the right side, on the right side, there's a set of the tools that, that we're using. Ushahidi is the, the one that's been used in a lot of these deployments and a lot of the screenshots you saw. You saw uh, Frontline SMS is a very simple uh, Java-based uh, SMS gateway that's being used for a variety of things throughout uh, impoverished countries. Sahana is like your open, is like a Swiss Army knife for disaster managers, and OpenStreetMap is an awesome, awesome kind of uh, wiki equivalent to Google, uh, Google Maps. So the, the, the final question I have for you guys is, uh, as I've gone through, as I've talked about these things, uh, just based on how you think, you've come up with things that, that weren't in the presentation. You've come up with things that, that I missed that I wasn't thinking about um, or didn't have time to talk about up here. What I could really use your help in doing is uh, coming up to me, talking to me, sending me an email, I'll be back in the question and answer room about the, those things. Tell me what we aren't thinking about because we need your help in pen testing these ideas. That's everything I've got. Thank you very much.